Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show where we are talking about self-care, advanced mental health, and alternatives to the medication merry-go-round. My first guest is Dr. Gregory Scott Brown. He is an integrative psychiatrist, mental health writer, and author. His commentary has appeared in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, on the Today Show, and on NPR. He is an advisory board member for Men's Health Magazine, where he regularly contributes content for mental health stories. And he is the author of The Self-Healing Mind, an essential five-step practice for overcoming anxiety and depression and revitalizing your life. Welcome, Dr. Brown. Thanks for sharing part of your day with me. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for having me. Happy to be here. Oh, I am always happy to talk about how we can help ourselves heal from depression and how we can bolster and improve our mental health. You and I share something in common with past battles with the dark cloud, as I like to right. call it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So let's talk about how depression and anxieties impede our decision-making abilities. Well, I mean, the thing about depression, and anxiety, both is that they're very common mental illnesses. Um, anxiety is one of the most common, if not the most common mental illness in the world. About 40 million Americans every year struggle with anxiety and depression is not far behind. And both of these conditions can make it difficult for us to make decisions, for us to think clearly, for us to function as we'd like, interact with our family and friends. And that's why it's important that we have these types of conversations because a lot of people, as you know, Lisa, who are struggling with these conditions don't necessarily get the help that they need. So that's why these conversations are important. And they don't often get the help that they need because there is a stigma up until now, I think. I think we're doing a better job of validating and normalizing the need to take care of our mental health. But there's a stigma around like us not being able to handle our affairs. Right. And I think that stigma is definitely one of the um, major issues that's prevented people from getting uh, professional mental health care in the past. I think we're doing a lot better job about that recently with destigmatization campaigns. You know, Prince Harry has come out and talked about mental health struggles. You have other uh, celebrities and influencers who have done the same. Um, but there are also other problems like access to care, you know, cost of therapy that also prevent people from uh, accessing that professional mental health care. And then when we talk about self-care, this is where we really can take control of our lives. What are the five pillars of self-care? So in my book, The Self-Healing Mind, I spend a lot of time discussing these five pillars, sleep, spirituality, nutrition, breath work, and movement. And uh, Lisa, through working with thousands of patients in my uh, clinic, I have come to understand that it's not just medications and talk therapy, although those are definitely important, but it's those self-care pillars that are also important for helping us overcome or get through any mental health care challenge. And I would also argue, argue and support that these five pillars protect our overall health care, that it's not just the mental health. It is how we can bulletproof all of our health. Well, well, listen, I mean, people have heard me say this before, and I'll say it again on your show. Mental health is health. Yes. I mean, they're, yes. they're the same, right? And so I think that, you know, if we are paying attention to these self-care strategies, just like you said, we're not only 
improving our mental health, but we are potentially improving our physical health as well. Let's go back to depression and anxiety and and how it affects our bodies, because I I would love our listeners to have a mental picture of this. If you think about the area above your eyes as being the, the dashboard or the control center of our executive functioning, and when we are in anxiety and when we are in depression, that prefrontal cortex area is not as effective in being able to make those decisions. And why is that? I mean, that, that, that's absolutely right. So uh, the prefrontal cortex, there are different parts of the brain that are implicated uh, when you're talking about mental illnesses. The prefrontal cortex, uh, the limbic system, the amygdala, which is responsible for um, anxiety and our fear response. It's like they're all just disjointed, not communicating with each other effectively. You know, we take moments for self-care, even if it means uh, a mindfulness activity or um, taking time for intentional breath. Uh, what we're in a sense doing is we're allowing these different parts of the brain to communicate with each other better. We're allowing um, important neurotransmitters like GABA, which are responsible for helping us calm down, slow down and relax, um, to really work as effectively as they can to help us feel better and get through the day. So we're talking about strengthening the muscle tone of the brain, really. That's ex- that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, and some people actually refer to improving our mental health as mental fitness, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think if we can approach mental health the same way as we do physical health, you know, going to the gym, exercising our body. I mean, the way we do that with the mind is by really focusing on these five pillars for self-care, exercising our mind. It really can make a huge difference. So what would you say to somebody when you, when you say to them, you know, it would be really great for you to have some movement, or it would be really great for you to focus on a little bit of your breathing. And they look at you with sort of that blank (laughs) stare. That happens every single day. I'm totally used to that look. Yeah. yeah, what I would say to them, I mean, Lisa, I mean, people have to, first of all, understand that when we're talking about self-care, we're not just talking about the bubble baths and the ritzy massages. You know, a lot of people say to me, you know, how can I go to the kitchen and make a kale and Swiss chard salad when I'm too depressed to even get out of the bed uh, in the morning, right? So what, what I'd say is start where you can, right? So self-care, in my view, is like oxygen. It's like food. It's so vital for us to survive and for us to thrive. And, you know, even something like incorporating a little bit of movement into your day, even if that just means walking to the mailbox or doing some simple stretches in your chair, right? Or learning to Um, improve your diet by making it just a little bit more Mediterranean, right? Adding pumpkin seeds to your favorite salad, right? Or your favorite dish um, without feeling like you totally have to revamp your life, uh, I think is the best way to start. Let's talk a little bit about getting out of the house and the value of being out Mm -hmm. in the sunshine, because there's medicinal value in that sunshine. Right. So the first thing is that, you know, being out in the sun, being exposed to sunlight um, is a great way to convert vitamin D into its active form. And we understand or learning more about the fact that, um, you know, vitamin D is correlated with uh, our mood. Right. And it's one of the most prevalent uh, uh, vitamin deficiencies in the world. Right. And so spending some time outside can help with that. The other thing is just being outside. Again, we're assuming that if we're outside, we're moving our bodies, right? And uh, moving our bodies can actually increase the expression of a protein called BDNF, which is kind of like a natural fertilizer in the brain. It allows our uh, neurons to communicate with each other more efficiently, and it's been uh, associated with a boost in mood as well. And there have been studies done, and I'm thinking about that Japanese study that was done some years ago about um, nature bathing and the impact of being outside in nature in an, in, the, in an effort to reduce suicide in the country of Japan and how successful that was. Right. I mean, I, and I wouldn't be surprised just because, you know, as, as we've mentioned, being outside, moving our body, um, you know, focusing on 
uh, mindfulness-based activities. This is not pseudoscience. This is evidence-based medicine. And I think anyone who's listening to this who has either struggled with a mental illness or anyone who's listening to this who has a brain, which is everyone, <laughs> uh, should really <laughs> focus on these self-care pillars because it's so important uh, for the way that we live, work, love, and interact with each other. Well, and Dr. Brown is prescribing it. Like right here and now, you're doing- I a, totally a, am, yep. <laughs> An audible Doctor's prescription, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you move your body, eat well, sleep well, play well, breathe well, you know, and feel better. It's not rocket right. science, but then again, it's so simple that sometimes the simple things are really hard to do. Right. And so the thing that I really focused on highlighting in my book, The Self-Healing Mind, is how we can each develop a playbook for you know, accessing these self-care pillars. Because I mean, it's easy to tell someone, hey, uh, take deep breaths or get better sleep or eat better. But a lot of us are like, you know, how, I mean, where do I even start? You know, um, it seems so easy. And so the thing that I point out in the book is that you know, there are specific strategies that we can actually access so that we can um, really pay attention to these self-care pillars that um, can help our everyday experience. And I think one of the other elements or angles that your book, The Self-Healing Mind, presents is uh, regarding men, men and mental health. And we're going to take a break in a minute. And when we come back, I want to really touch upon that because our show, we have a lot of women, mostly women, but there are some Mm -hmm. guys. But how can we help our, you know, our husbands, our sons, our lovers, our brothers and our friends? Yeah access this mental health care in such a way or with the same passion they approach their work or their bodybuilding? You know, there's kind of a disconnect there, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Lisa, that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book. So when I was in my early 20s, you know, I was a young guy who was struggling with depression and there wasn't a book like this around back then. I was very resistant to the idea of professional mental health care Um, I remember my mom took me to a therapist. I actually walked out (laughs) of a couple of those sessions uh, because I I just didn't feel comfortable being there. I didn't know what to say. And so I'm hoping that this book can reach as many people as possible. And, you know, for women who are listening to this, who um, have a guy in their life, whether it's their son or dad or husband that they think will benefit from this message, go out and get this book and Um, you know, give it to them as a gift because you never know. I mean, reading through this might be that catalyst that really, um, you know, encourages that man in your life to get professional mental health uh, health care if if that's what they need. Let's take a pause. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with Dr. Gregory Scott Brown to learn more about Dr. Brown and his work. Please visit GregoryScottBrown.com. You can find him on Twitter at Gregory S. Brown, MD. And that's the same handle on Facebook and Instagram, Gregory S. Brown, MD. We're talking about the self-healing mind, an essential five-step practice for overcoming anxiety and depression and revitalizing your life. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Wait, wait, wait. Before we take that break, need I remind you, tis the season to be jolly and all that jazz. This means it's time for holiday gift giving, and I'm focused on meaningful gifts that help connect me to the people who matter most. One of my favorite presents to give is StoryWorth, an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories through meaningful storytelling. StoryWorth is one of the easiest and most creative ways to strengthen bonds, preserve memories, take a deep dive into family history, and create a precious keepsake. Last year, I gave one of my bonus moms StoryWorth. Her keepsake book has allowed me to know her in new ways, and I loved hearing how much she enjoyed writing her favorite stories. StoryWorth is the best darn hassle-free and no-ship gift that will make your loved ones feel cherished and connected no matter how near or far they may be. When you purchase StoryWorth for someone you love, each week they will receive an email with a meaningful question designed to elicit entertaining, surprising, and sometimes moving responses. For example, what is one of the craziest things that has happened to you? 
After one year, StoryWorth will compile all stories, including photos, into a beautifully printed hardbound book that will be a treasure for future generations. With StoryWorth, I am giving those I love most a thoughtful personal gift from the heart and preserving their memories and stories for years to come. Go to storyworth.com slash HH and save $10 on your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash HH to save $10 on your first purchase. Now here comes the pause. We'll be right back. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we're back talking with my guest, Dr. Gregory Scott Brown, about self-care, advanced mental health, and alternatives to the medication merry-go-round. Let's get back to it. So (laughs) at the break, Dr. Brown, you and I were having having a good giggle about how to approach the man in your life when their mental health could use a little tune-up. Right. And so what, what we mentioned, I don't think this is too far off. I mean, sometimes you have to mansplain things for us guys a little bit, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, mental health, sometimes um, it's kind of like having a, a flat tire or needing an oil change or tune up um, in your car. Um, and, you know, I, I think the more that guys can understand that mental health, again, is something that impacts every aspect of our life, Right. Um, that if we are more mindful, then we are more efficient um, at work. If we are more present, then we're able to be a better dad or a better spouse or a better lover. I mean, these things are important for guys. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, helping guys understand their importance can really encourage them to pay better attention to their mental health. As you were describing this, I'm flashing on some video that was made, YouTube video that went viral a few years ago called It's Not About the Nail. And I don't know if you recall it, but it's a man and woman sitting on the sofa and the woman is talking to her her, her spouse or partner about how hard something was. And she's going on and on about it's just, just, just so hard. And, you know, how men want to fix it and women just want their guys just to listen. And then suddenly yeah. you see her profile and she's got a nail sticking out of her forehead. And he's telling her, <laughs> <laughs> trying to tell her, if you just remove the nail, the problem will be solved. Well, it's right. kind of that in reverse, right? Right, right, right. And the other thing, Lisa, that, you know, I just want to spend some time talking about Here's a lot of men who struggle with mental illnesses, whether it's depression or anxiety, they have a hard time identifying it as that. So, so, so many guys that I treat in my practice will come in and they'll tell me, um, oh, I'm, I'm drinking too much. You know, I need you to help me cut back on alcohol. And after that third or fourth session, I realized the reason they're drinking so much is because they're depressed and they haven't really talked to anyone or processed that with anyone. Or other guys will come in and they'll say, oh, you know, I think I have ADHD. Um, Can you give me a stimulant that will, you know, get rid of it, that will fix it, help me be more productive, right? And again, two or three sessions and I realize what the real issue is, is that they're anxious and they don't really understand the signs of anxiety and how that can impact concentration. So again, through conversations like this and sharing these conversations, I think it can help all of us, man or woman. Um, understand mental health, what it looks like, and how we can treat it. I also think that the element of not being alone, I know that when I went through a mental health crisis, if you will, I was 30 years old, it lasted a year, and I felt very alone going into it, you know? Right. And then once I realized that I wasn't alone, and this does happen to people when they go through major upheavals in their lives and traumatic events, being able to talk about it and normalize and and validate that, yes, when we go through things, it is actually normal to feel these things. If we don't feel these things, we bottle it up, we store it away, and then it appears 20 or 30 years later. And that's why, you know, I spend so much um, time and effort in my own work, um, you know, sharing my story. I am a psychiatrist. I treat depression, but I've also experienced it. Right. I mean, just because just because, you know, I have a medical degree or I've written a book or 
you know, do this type of uh, wellness advocacy work doesn't mean that, um, you know, I'm not at risk for these same conditions that millions of people in the United States and around the world face it as well. Now, my message here that I want people to hear is that um, this is a this is a hopeful conversation because people can get better, right? Um, and they do get better, and it all starts with having those productive conversations about how you feel. The worst thing you can do is to suffer in silence. Yeah. And the suffering in silence, as many people do, is scary and it's sad and it actually exacerbates the condition. That's totally right. And and the other thing is, you know, if you're a caregiver of someone who is struggling with depression, you know, especially if you're a woman taking care of a, a man in your life, um, you know, one of the ways that depression manifests in men and in adolescence, I should say, of both genders is irritability. And so, <laughs> right, right. Guys can get cranky. Um, they can, you know, reject your love. They can try to push you away. And it's not them. It's the depression that is causing them to behave that way. And so what often happens is, you know, a guy is pushing you out of uh, his life. And then that leads to more isolation and just exacerbates the condition. So the, the best thing that you can do, you know, if you're taking care of a guy in your life and struggling with depression is to number one, encourage professional help. And the other thing you got to do is to, you know, smother that guy with as much love and compassion as you possibly can. Yeah. I think that is one of the secret sauces here. That's the sixth yeah. pillar, the sixth element, you know, number six, right? Yeah. <laughs> number six, you know, yeah. love wildly, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to include that in the self-healing mind part too, right? <laughs> yes, and I think so. I do think that that is the secret salve to to yeah. this too is that it is is high quality love. You know, it's not just if someone says, right. "Oh, I love you." You know, of course, I love you. You're my partner, but it is how do we how do we show and express and nurture that love to the people closest to us, especially when they're hurting. Right, and I'll tell you, it's not it's not easy. So I don't want to. I don't want to pretend like it's an easy process, you know, especially when depression is, you know, telling you a bunch of lies and being mean to you and, um, you know, pushing you away. But, you know, even as a psychiatrist, sometimes I'm on the receiving end of that from my patients who are trying to push me away. Um, but, you know, the, the longer you can hang in there, um, you notice that at the end of, of that, when people do ultimately get better, they are so grateful uh, to you for not abandoning them through that process. And I think we should emphasize that depression is so treatable. Anxiety is yes. so treatable. Yes. You know, yes. it's like if you have a headache and you take Tylenol or aspirin or drink a, a, a strong cup of coffee, you know right. that's going to help the headache go away. Well, the same is true in this mental health sphere too. And we don't spend enough time talking about that, yeah. Lisa. I yes, mean, you we know, don't. when people Well, when we people, are. You and right, me. <laughs> but, right. But when people think about it, I mean, people think about mental health or mental illness. I mean, the things that come to mind are depression, anxiety, suicide, you know, maybe derogatory words like crazy or insane. I mean, we don't think about hope. We don't think about living with purpose and balance and contentment, right? Oh. And those are the things that I think we need to focus on when it comes to mental health, because that really applies to everyone in the world, regardless of whether or not you've been diagnosed with a mental illness. Well, that's now the uh, seventh pillar is the, <laughs> is, the mean, is the meaningful work, right? Like being of use yeah. to society, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you know, right. and yeah. that that's a that is a huge antidepressant, actually. It totally is. It totally is. Right. And I think that you know, the more time we can spend really focused on living with purpose, balance, contentment, and hope, um, the better off we'll be not only today, but uh, tomorrow and in the years to come. Agreed. And also how we teach our children, you know, as a, right. a, a formerly depressed person, I know that that impacted the way I parented my kids and how I made conversation about feelings important. And I suspect that this is how we change the legacy also around mental health. And we're seeing more people, more parents and more teachers, you know, 
really pay attention to the importance of social and emotional learning. Um, you know, education, I guess, from an early age. And yes. So there, there are a couple of groups in Austin where I spent some time where my clinic is based um, that actually focus on that, you know, focus on after school programs, um, focus on um, education, because again, I think that it's important that our children, as they grow up, understand their emotions, learn how to talk about them, um, because I don't think that it's always innate. It's something that we really have to be intentional about teaching. Yeah. I would love to hang out with you again. Like we, we have so let's, much more to talk it. about we, we, yeah. we, and we will do it because I think that these conversations help heal. Before we go off, I want to just remind everybody that, you know, if you don't have access to mental health care in your direct community, that COVID has given us the gift of telehealth now being right. a very normal part of healthcare practices. Whether you have insurance or you don't have insurance, there is access for everybody now. And I think that has been the upside of the plague, if you will, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the thing about it is, just like we were saying earlier, if if you are struggling and you're having trouble accessing um, a professional, uh, a mental health care professional, I mean, there's so many places that you can um, reach out to. I mean, psychologytoday.com is a great resource. Calling your local university and asking them for referrals is another resource. Um, and as you mentioned, Lisa, you know, so many of us are in the telehealth world these days. So um, that actually expands access to care as well. Dr. Gregory Scott Brown, you are an angel. I can't wait to hang out with you again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> um, you so much, Lisa. Yeah. I highly recommend this book, The Self Healing Mind, an essential five step practice for overcoming anxiety and depression and revitalizing your life. Please give it to anybody in your life, not just the guys in your life. I think. Everybody can benefit from this book and learn how to take better care of ourselves. To learn more, please visit Gregory S. Scott. Um, I'm going to say that line again. To learn more, please visit Gregory Scott Brown .com, on Twitter at Gregory S. Brown MD. And the same goes for Facebook and Instagram. That's Gregory S. Brown MD. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. We'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. We're back continuing the conversation with my next guest, Dr. David Feifel. We're talking about self-care, advanced mental health, and alternatives to the medication merry-go-round. David Feifel, he has earned a medical degree and a PhD in neurobiology from the University of Toronto, Canada. He completed an internship in internal medicine at Toronto General Hospital and his residency training in psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, where he currently holds the rank of full professor. And Dr. Feifel has a, a lot of qualifications and, and, and focus in the study of depression, ADHD, mood disorders, anxiety management. And he's come to talk to us today about what's on the horizon. And there are a couple of really exciting um, areas that are showing great promise in the treatment of depression. Welcome, Dr. Feifel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, well, this is a pleasure. And this is uh, something, you know, I often ask my clients, I, I do a lot of addiction and trauma recovery, and I ask them what they want to know about. And the, the younger clients all want to know about ketamine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, is a, it is a very uh, interesting and uh, yeah, a, a very unconventional development for, for psychiatry, let's put it that way. Well, let's talk about, first of all, just the scope of the problem of clinical depression, because depression really is rampant. Um, loneliness in, in society, particularly in, in, in the Western world, I think really is, is an epidemic. And we focused on that in the past. But, but depression, when it's, you know, when it's in our DNA, when we come from a family a line where there is depression, how, 
how do we get ourselves help? What are some of the, the, the things that we can do that would bring us to someone like you or a center like yours where we can get help? Well, I think one of the, uh, one of the first things is to be able to recognize um, when, uh, when somebody is suffering, whether it's yourself or, or one of your loved ones, when somebody is suffering from depression, um, that, that really is um, you know, beyond sort of what, the, what the, we colloquial talk about, uh, you know, being down or having a dour personality, it really is sort of a, a clinical um, dysfunction where the capacity to feel uh, pleasure uh, the, the centers in the brain uh, that, that allow us to, you know, look forward to things and to be excited about things, even when when, when things aren't so rosy, um, those 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 centers start to shut down, and the life, all the richness of life starts to kind of go away, and everything becomes very dark and drab. So, I guess I would say the first thing is to recognize when something is just not right. This is not the way, uh, sort of quote unquote, a normal person should feel. And uh, that leads one to, to start asking, you know, how to get help. And this brings up a very good point. We're not talking about the blues. We're not talking about situational depression or sadness where someone dies or someone's going through a difficult period of time. Maybe they've lost their job or they're going through a divorce. We're talking about something that is pervasive, ongoing, um, that life is not um, able to be viewed or experienced in color. Exactly right. Exactly right. This is, you know, unfortunately, they, uh, depression is used in two ways. It's it's used, in, in, you know, in gosh, I'm really depressed. My team lost yesterday, kind of a way where we know we, we really mean this is sort of just a, I'm just I'm feeling just temporarily a little bit down because of a kind of a normal disappointment. Uh, um, and we also use it when we talk about uh, you know the clinical uh, medical condition, which is technically we call it clinical depression, major depression, uh, but, but there we're talking about a very different thing. We're talking about a pervasive uh, uh, decrease in ability to kind of, you know, just have our brain function normally and feel the normal uh, ups and downs of life. And would you uh, agree or disagree that part of the problem with um, the lack of sufficient treatment available today is in part due to the stigma? Yes, absolutely. I, I think I think it's something that I've seen uh, in, in, over my career get better, but it's there's no doubt about it that it remains a major hurdle to um, uh, to people you know, seeking out appropriate treatment and getting better. I think it is something that uh, people are not as comfortable admitting to as they would, for example, if they if they started to have symptoms of uh, of, of, of cardiovascular disease or metabolic disease or or anything like that. So it remains sort of somewhat apart from, from other uh, you know, organ dysfunctions, if you will. And, and, and the destigmatization of depression and making it okay for people to seek treatment, I think, will improve largely in part to more being written and, and, and produced about it in the media. People who do have depression coming forward and talking about their own successful experiences um, uh, of how they got better, you know, that it's really okay. You can, you can be depressed and you can get better. Absolutely. I, I, think, I think the role of the media and celebrities and so forth is, is just huge because I think that people, you know, uh, look, look, look to, towards them for what is normal and what is, uh, you know, what is okay to, to, to admit. And here's the interesting part, that in, in when, when uh, people who are treating um, clients in a clinical setting, you know, the old school paradigm is, is the clinician doesn't self-disclose, right? It, it, they're supposed to be sort of the, the neutral um, conduit for the work to occur. However, in my own practice in working with clients who are in, in some cases experiencing severe depression, when I made the choice to begin to disclose about my own challenges in the past, something shifted in them in that they were able to see hope. They were able to see possibility. Yes, I think I think that's actually very powerful, and that sort of uh, that paradigm of sort of uh, aloofness, I think, is 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 starting to give way to a more a more kind of realistic uh, uh, expectation of uh, the the the, the, the uh, doctor, or the therapist uh, patient relationship, and uh, and uh, I think I think uh, I think uh, 
of you know being being just being a you know a fellow human being also is is, is an important part of the therapy process. So probably, uh, you know, I wouldn't say probably for sure, not just in psychiatry or psychology, but uh, in in medicine in general. So I think I think I think in, in some respect, our, our patients want to see us as 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 having more knowledge and uh, uh, and uh, wisdom than them, but they also want to see us at the same time. As, as humans uh, as well, that the same kind of vulnerabilities and, uh, and challenges. And I believe that sort of taps into trust. You know, that we, we begin to trust people when we have proof that what they are saying has value and then it, and then that, that it is um, actually true. They can see somebody who says, you know, I've had terrible depression and I've been able to get through it. Here's how you too possess the tools and resources and you've outsourced support to get yourself help and you too will get there. You need to stay the course. You need to work through whatever treatment protocol you've developed with your clinicians, but there is hope. Um, and, and really that's what I want to talk about too now is tapping into hope. And we started the conversation talking about the drug ketamine and I would love before we go to break in a couple of minutes, I'd love to tell our listeners a little bit about this drug because many of them may not be aware of its original uses, the recreational uses that young people love so much, and then um, how it has evolved into being prescribed. Well, sure, yeah. Well, ketamine is, is, uh, is really, uh, although it's, it, it's, it's seeing uh, a completely new life uh, in terms of treating people with uh, psychiatric illness, uh, it's really an old uh, medication. It's been around, I think, since the 1960s. Uh, developed um, as an, an anesthetic, and it, it's, it's an anesthetic that continues to be highly used today uh, in every major hospital and outpatient outpatient surgical, uh, you know, suite. I think that you'll find ketamine being used because it's a very, very useful. Um, Agent in, uh, in, in uh, putting people to sleep for surgical procedures, and um, and uh, you mentioned the uh, sort of I think the, the street use of ketamine was discovered uh, by people that it also has um, some very uh, interesting let's put it this way recreational uh, properties. So it's, it goes by the street name of the Special K and other things because it uh, produces a psychedelic kind of experience at doses that are lower. Um, obviously, than the, the doses that uh, doctors and anesthesiologists use to put people out. Uh, about um, about uh, 15 years ago, um, um, a, a group out of the Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in New York City did a, did a study where they were, where they were looking at um, they were interested in the pharmacological properties of uh, of, of ketamine. It, it represents a, a category. A drug that uh, that modifies a chemical system in the brain that's uh, that's very important. So they were, they they really had very uh, scientific uh, uh, goals to find out what happens to people when you modify this chemical system. And so they did a small study where they took people with uh, with depression, uh, ty- typically people who had, who had not responded to other medications, and they infused ketamine at very low doses, and they were really surprised to see. That uh, a large percentage of those patients experienced a very rapid improvement in their depression, and that started off uh, a great interest in it. This is amazing. We're going to go to a break, and when we come back, we'll carry on the discussion. I want to direct our listeners to you at UCSD to learn more about Dr. David Feifel. Please go to profiles.ucsd.edu slash david.feifel, F-E-I-F-E-L. I will repeat the contact information later on in the show. We will take that break, and you do clinical research on campus, and you are researching ketamine as well as TMS, correct? That's correct, yes. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, 
with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. And we're back continuing the conversation with my guest, Dr. David Feifel. We're talking about self-care, advanced mental health, and alternatives to the medication merry-go-round. Let's return to the conversation. And we'll get into TMS in a moment, but I just wanted to wrap up the thoughts that David has on ketamine and why it is such a valuable drug in the research that you're doing now. Dr. Feifel, please just carry on about, about ketamine. Well, um, I should clarify, by the way, that we are both doing research and also uh, we're one of the first um, uh, places, I think, to go beyond the, just the, uh, the research and actually offer uh, ketamine to, uh, to patients uh, as, a, as a clinical treatment. Um, so I, I think that I think what, uh, what drives a lot of the excitement uh, about ketamine is that, um, you know, our, our field of psychiatry um, has been frustrated for, for, for Quite a long time, in that we have not uh, we've had we've not had anything new to offer patients. Um, medications uh, do come out and um, uh, and are, are marketed, but essentially for really since the first first uh, established antidepressants were uh, were developed in the 60s, these antidepressants uh, aren't that uh, different from each other. The efficacy rates are quite similar. And um, so we have a, a, a whole slew of, uh, of, of, of uh, medications uh, created by the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, unfortunately, there's a, a very large percentage of people with clinical depression that do not uh, benefit from that. So we, so we have this group of people called uh, that we refer to as having treatment-resistant depression, or TRD. And, um, uh, and, and for, for a long time, there was really not a lot of options other than uh, ECT, or what uh, is, is sometimes colloquially referred to as shock therapy, uh, for them, which is a big sort of step forward. It's very invasive, uh, has a lot of side effects. And then it was discovered that ketamine, uh, through this uh, study that I had mentioned, had this remarkable ability to uh, produce rapid improvement of depression within hours in some cases, which is something we've never seen in depression. Our treatments all, all take a while to to kick in, and here was something that worked right away. And um, so we began, started starting to research this and also starting to offer it to patients who were in that TRD category. And it's been quite remarkable. Um, there, it's, it's, not, it's not a panacea. This is not a drug that's, uh, you know, it's a cure-all for, for depression or anything else. But, um, but, but many, uh, many patients who really uh, had no hope and were not responding to other things, um, are, are getting relief uh, from, from ketamine. What's interesting about it is that its antidepressant um, use uh, requires that it be given at, at doses uh, that are much lower than the doses uh, traditionally used for anesthesiology to put people to sleep, for example, for a surgery. And at those lower doses, uh, people have a psychedelic trip. So we administer it to, uh, you know, in the clinic or in the hospital, and patients uh, will you know, have a you know, 30 to 45 minute uh, uh, trip where they, we call it, the, 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 the type of trip is called a dissociative trip, where they're, uh, where they're feeling that their, their, their consciousness and their body are disconnected and they, uh, they often mm. feel like their, 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 their consciousness is floating and is often a very positive, uh, relaxing feeling and they often feel that they, they, they have insight into the nature of the universe. It's kind of a, Experience that many people describe as spiritual or like uh, or very godlike, where they you know, just uh, uh, you know, they feel very uh, uh, they lose their sense of self and become very one with the universe. The trip is the, the trip ends, and they and, and ketamine washes out very quickly, and they're able to uh, then you know uh, go home with uh, uh, with uh, the supervision of uh, of somebody and. Uh, and, and often within uh, uh, within 24 hours, uh, if not if, if not immediately with the trip itself, they will experience a very dramatic uh, improvement in their depression. Now, the big uh, I was going to just add that the very the, the big limitation to ketamine that we're all struggling with is the fact that 
these benefits will only last uh, a short period of time, anywhere from a couple of days to uh, a couple of weeks, and in some cases maybe uh, you know over a month from a single treatment. So patients do need to come back and get boosters, uh, as it stands now, to get to continue. The benefit. So what what I wanted to just um, ask you is, you run a neuropsychopharmacology laboratory on campus at UCSD Medical Center. If somebody wants to explore the uses of ketamine for their depression, would they be able to come into your program? How would one seek seek this out to find you or access to the treatment? Well, we have a, we, we, we have a, uh, an email address where, where uh, they, can, uh, they can email us. My team will, uh, will receive the email and provide them information about, you know, um, how, you know, how to move forward in terms of uh, you know, filling out some forms and then coming in for an intake and so forth. And uh, I can give you that, uh, that uh, email address if you want. To yes, I, w- I would love to share it because, I mean, this is really uh, offering hope for relief for many who up until now perhaps have been hopeless. I mean, certainly this is what I see in the clients that I work with. You know, those who are challenged by addiction will ultimately say, you know, that depression is where it started for them, you know, and they were trying to find relief when they couldn't have relief in conventional treatment. The That's antidepressants correct. were not working. And um, ECT, like you mentioned prior, is such an invasive option with, with side effects. And I do know this firsthand because I've had family members who have gone through it um, in terms of uh, memory loss and just a kind of a, a general slow factor or malaise that is present uh, after the treatments. It's, it's hard. And so ketamine does offer some hope. And the other area that, that I'm really excited to talk with you about is transcranial magnetic stimulation, also known as TMS. Um, most people do not know of this uh, treatment, uh, how it works, and how to find the treatment. Yes, TMS really uh, is um, uh, revolutionary. Uh, I, I think along with, with ketamine, it is the other thing that's, that's really uh, exciting in the field of psychiatry in terms of uh, breakthroughs after a long period of, of, of uh, relatively few uh, advances. Now, TMS is a paradigm shift in the way uh, we go about treating uh, depression and, and, and in the future we think other psychiatric things in that it, 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 it's, it's non-pharmacological, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sort of rely on changing, uh, directly changing the chemical yeah, imbalance in the brain, which is sort of, kind of a, a storyline that I think has become very popularized about depression being a chemical imbalance, which is really the truth. The dirty little secret is uh, that um, there's no scientific evidence for it. Um, um, what, what there is evidence for it is Can that you just say it, that again? Because that's really important. <clears throat> That it, the, it, it, in the past or up until now, people have considered depression a, 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 a hormonal or chemical imbalance in the body. And what I heard you just say is that, uh, that there, there's no proof of that. That's correct. That's, that, that, that unfortunately is a nice, uh, a nice story, a nice narrative. Um, but, uh, but we've known for a long time that the whole notion that, that there's some missing chemical or some low chemical in the brain is absolutely uh, not substantiated by by, by the scientific evidence. Uh, people people have been looking for chemical abnormalities at, after for half a century, not uh, not found any. Um, we, we I think I think it's largely driven by the fact that you know medications were discovered uh, initially by serendipity um, to, to to help in uh, in depression and other uh, other uh, psychiatric conditions, and therefore the corollary of that was the assumption that. Well, you know that must mean that the depression itself is, uh, if it can be improved by 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 drugs, it must be somehow a chemically related um, uh, condition that causing it. And since these drugs boost a certain category of medication, uh, uh, sorry, of chemicals in the brain called uh, monoamines, which are things like serotonin, which many people I think have heard of, and dopamine and noradrenaline. Because of that. There was an assumption that uh, uh, depression must must represent uh, a, a low, low, uh, abnormally low levels. Well, we've we've never found low levels of those chemicals in people's brains. Uh, when we when we can actually experimentally lower those levels, people don't become depression. 
And the other thing is that the medications boost those le boost levels of those med of those chemicals within hours, but they don't improve depression within hours. So all those things really uh, indicate that um, you know this is not really uh, a straightforward nice uh, you know, tied up storyline. Yeah. Sounds like. Um, so, with ketamine, you know we now know that it is administered as an inpatient process, or if, uh, you go into hospital for a period of time to receive the treatment. What about transcranial magnetic stimulation? Is that done on an outpatient basis, and and how many treatments generally are required to have some responsiveness? Yes, TMS is done on an outpatient basis. Um, uh, it, the, the, the protocols uh, that are, are are used today, and it's a very it's a, it's a, it's a continuously uh, changing uh, field, uh, um, are that people come in every single day for about a, a thirty to forty minute uh, treatment uh, for four to six weeks. And the uh, the difference here is what we do. What we are, we're targeting are uh, circuits, brain circuits, uh, in um, that, that we know fire abnormally in depression. So um, these, uh, the, the, the device uh, uses uh, pulsed magnets to, to physically uh, coax those brain circuits to, to increase their natural firing rate the way they, 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 that we see that they do in people who don't have depression. Um, and over time, it, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a um, physical uh, personal trainer for brain cells that are, 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 are a little bit too sedentary um, and in a specific part of the brain, in the left frontal part of the brain, this is really where we, um, uh, we, we target. So um, over time, those brain circuits um, start to fire on their own, uh, just like, uh, just like uh, you know, a person who is sedentary uh, after several weeks of being kind of coaxed to, to, to exercise by a trainer, will start to feel uh, you know, uh, more motivated and uh, more fit, and start to kind of work out on their own. And then we see people uh, typically start to uh, recover from depression. Dr. Freifel, we are out of time, and I uh, right now want to invite you to come back because I think what you have to share is so valuable. And if we can help in any way to get this information out. I want to do more of this. Before we go, I want to give uh, the website to find out more about you and what you do, and that would be http colon double backslash profiles dot ucsd dot edu uh, slash david dot feifel, f-e-i-f-e-l. And you can also probably get to him by Googling Dr. David Feifel, who is a founding director of the UCSD Adult ADHD program, the UCSD Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Program, and the Center for Advanced Treatment of Mood and Anxiety Disorders, and that would be where the ketamine information would lie. David, thank you so much for being with us, and um, will you come back, share more? I absolutely will. I'll be delighted to. Oh, great. We will, we're going to make that a date. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa cypress Cayman on behalf of my guests, Dr. Gregory Scott Brown and Dr. David Feifel, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio. KBUURadioMalibu.net and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.